Egypt in the time of the pharaohs, a rich and powerful empire. But the people of Israel live in slavery, oppressed by a tyrannical pharaoh. To win their freedom, Moses sends 10 plagues on Pharaoh's land. As God's fury, they sweep over Egypt. The plagues bring desolation, disease, and death. At least according to the Bible. Are they just legends? Or did these events really happen? The waters of the Nile turn to blood. Fish die, frogs invade the land, insects attack man and beast. Disease follows. Are these biblical plagues real disasters from the past, held in the memory of the peoples who lived through them? Scientists excavating an ancient Egyptian city have remarkable evidence that climate change could have been the cause of the Bible plagues. Biologists see evidence of a natural chain reaction. What did happen on the Nile 3,000 years ago? Jerusalem, 700 years before Christ. In the thriving capital city of the Israelites, there's a spirit of religious renewal. In the new writing schools and scriptoria of the temples, Hebrew scholars are combining ancient texts and folk memories to form an epoch-making work. It is the birth of the Holy Scriptures. This is where the scholars author the story of the Ten Plagues, a central event in a great epic, a radical new account of revelation and creation. A new God appears on the stage of faith. He reveals himself to Moses in the shape of a burning bush. One and almighty, the God Yahweh. He chooses Moses as his prophet and the people of Israel as his people. In Egypt, the Israelites live as slaves in the service of the Pharaoh. God has promised them freedom and a homeland and gives Moses the task of leading them from slavery into the land of Israel. It's an arduous and wondrous journey that the Bible describes. The book of Exodus captured this story in words. We don't know what ancient accounts inspired the scribes. They themselves dated the original stories far before their own time. At their center is the heroic figure of Moses. As God's prophet, he demands that the Pharaoh release his people. Signs and miracles are to demonstrate God's power. At his command, Aaron's rod turns into a snake before the Egyptian ruler. The duel, the test of strength, is opened. The godlike pharaoh is not impressed. His own magicians are just as powerful. When the two snakes do battle and Moses' snake wins, Pharaoh does not admit defeat. The Bible says he hardens his heart and refuses to let the people of Israel go. It's not possible to confirm the Bible stories historically because Moses' opponent, the Pharaoh, is never given a name. But there is a hint to the location of the action in the mention of two ancient Egyptian cities, Pitom and Ramses. 
It's interesting that in the biblical account of the Exodus, the Pharaoh has no name. But the first chapter of Exodus names two cities, Pitom and Ramses. So it's quite possible the authors were thinking of P. Ramses, once the capital of Egypt, when they wrote this account. P. Ramses was a great metropolis on the Nile Delta. But this city, the biblical city of Ramses, suddenly disappeared off the map in ancient times and was only rediscovered at the end of the 20th century. Its downfall has long puzzled archaeologists and historians. Was it caused by natural disasters? Egypt, the Nile Delta. While excavating the area around Kantia in the 1990s, archaeologist Edgar Push found the foundations of the city of Ramses. We came here to find out whether our theories were right, that this is the location of Ramses city. We were sure they were correct, but there was no proof. A sign on the city gates, an entry sign, you are entering the city of Ramses, that simply doesn't exist. Cantier in the Nile Delta, 1996. Edgar's team scanned the surface with a cesium magnetometer, one strip at a time. This technique can trace the remains of ancient buildings five meters underground. It provides a kind of X-ray of long-vanished constructions. When the pictures were analyzed, the results were sensational they discovered an entire unknown city with broad avenues and narrow alleyways, wealthy villa districts, crowded workers' quarters, temples and palace complexes. And it was seriously big. This city extends over an area of 30 square kilometers. Several branches of the Pelusian arm of the Nile once flowed through it. It was without doubt a fabulously wealthy city. The Anastasi Papyrus tells us in its Hymn of Splendor that everyone wanted to live there. The great pharaoh Ramses II has given his own name to the legendary city of Ramses. Its prime position on the Nile makes it a powerful attraction to merchants and travelers. A tourist reports enthusiastically to a friend back home. This is a wonderful place to stay. The countryside hereabouts is full of good things. There are onions, lettuce, pomegranates, olives, figs, and sweet wine. Everyone is happy, and no one says, if I could only have. The common people are doing just as well as the rich people. P. Ramses seems to be a paradise. There are no records of a crisis here, or a series of plagues. And yet this city would experience a disaster that would change everything. Here, beside the sacred river, P. Ramses was built for eternity. The Nile guaranteed the city's future. All along its length, the ancient Egyptians worshipped the river. Its waters made the desert bloom. All life was connected with it. The Bible tells how Moses summons the first plague with one stroke of his rod on the waters. This first plague strikes the Egyptians at their most vulnerable point. Their current of life transformed into a tide of death. 
the Nile turns red, begins to stink and becomes undrinkable. Just as the god Yahweh had predicted, all the waters of Egypt turned to blood. The drinking water is contaminated. The fish die. The plague stories, plagues one to nine, reflect knowledge gained through experience. We'd call it experiential scientific knowledge, combined with expert guesswork. At the Jerusalem Temple School, they were taking phenomena they knew happened, and they knew happened rarely, and were trying to explain them. The Nile turning murky or red was nothing new for the people of Egypt. Desert sandstorms would deposit red dust on the water's surface. And with each annual flood, red earth from the highlands of Ethiopia was swept into the river. These were hardly catastrophes. But if the river should ever be contaminated, that would spell disaster for an entire way of life. At Berlin's Leibniz Institute for Water Ecology and Inland Fisheries, they study the complex interaction of ecological systems. The hydrologists here believe that the first plague, the contamination of the Nile, may have been caused by an infestation of poisonous blue algae. They even have a prime suspect. They're investigating the properties of burgundy blood algae, actually a bacterium, and it fits the bill better than any other algae. It thrives in fresh water. We know it existed 3,000 years ago. It's highly toxic, and it's red. Biologist Stefan Pflugmacher is intrigued by the chance to solve an ancient mystery. One possible explanation for the red colouring of the Nile is the appearance of burgundy blood algae, Oscillatoria rubescens, a beautiful raspberry-coloured species of cyanobacteria. It multiplies massively in slow-moving warm waters with high levels of nutrition, and as it dies, it stains the water red. Off the coast of western Florida, they encounter a similar phenomenon. They regularly see dangerous algae blooms with disastrous effects. This toxic display is known as the red tide. The algae isn't always red. In deeper waters, it's colorless. So the scientists have to take samples at different levels and in different locations to check how widely the deadly bacteria has spread. Alan Cembella is one of the world's leading toxic algae researchers. In some cases, the algae form a, a superficial layer on, on top of the water. That's a so-called classic red tide, where you can actually see water discoloration. But uh, much more often, the bloom is, in fact, subsurface. You can't see anything from looking with your naked eye into the water column. These algae are called Corania brevis. They're hundredths of a millimeter long, aggressive, toxic algae that give off a nerve gas. The scientists have found more than a million per litre in their samples. A Karenia bloom can last for weeks or months, even up to a year. 
Today, more than 60 species of toxic algae have been identified in our oceans, lakes and rivers. And there's nothing we can do about them. The algae evolved presumably uh, hundreds of millions of years ago. They're not new. Uh, they occurred before human beings were here and, and probably will be there long after human beings are gone from the face of the Earth. A plague of algae could have occurred at any time in the past. And certainly on the ancient Egyptian Nile. The first biblical plague ends after seven days. The god Yahweh's first triumph over Pharaoh and all his gods. Like Hapi, the river god in whom the Egyptians worshipped the sacred Nile. This great statue sunk in the Mediterranean off the coast of Alexandria is proof of his importance. Hapi, mighty ruler of the Nile, one of the greatest of the Egyptian deities. But in the first plague, the Bible makes it clear that he too is powerless. You could say that the story of the plagues is a struggle between the gods, because the pharaoh represents the gods of Egypt, the whole pantheon. And by attacking the pharaoh, Yahweh is attacking Egypt's gods. So the idea behind the plagues is to show that Yahweh is superior to Egypt, superior to the pharaoh, and also to the gods he represents. The miracle of the first plague does not win the Israelites their freedom. Pharaoh, the Bible says, hardens his heart. Then God instructs Moses, Go unto Pharaoh and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. And if thou refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all thy borders with frogs. The Pharaoh that Moses has to deal with is stubborn. He has a boundlessly exaggerated opinion of himself. He's a despot, oppressing people in a totally arbitrary way. That's a malicious misrepresentation, a polemical view of Egypt, because, of course, the Pharaoh had the gods above him, and he was responsible to them. The Bible chooses not to mention that, of course, the Egyptians had their own concept of justice, and the Pharaoh knew perfectly well that the gods were above him. The Pharaoh of the Bible hardened his heart. After the red tide, the misery of the second plague followed. Frogs left the water in their millions. The size of a frog population experiences natural variations. At the Leibniz Institute in Berlin, scientists are trying to find out what can cause a plague of frogs. What environmental changes lead to abnormal development and mass metamorphosis? The transformation of a tadpole into a frog is governed by hormones. The process usually takes eight to ten weeks. The scientists discover that environmental stress causes frog metamorphosis to accelerate. In this experiment, the tadpoles are artificially stressed. They've been fed extra hormones. Their rate of metamorphosis is measured under the microscope. It turns out that negative environmental conditions can nearly double their rate of development. Professor Werner Kloas explains what kind of environmental stimuli are most to blame. 
When tadpoles come under stress, especially due to drought, but also when there's a lack of oxygen, then this environmental stress accelerates their transformation into frogs. Their thyroid gland releases extra hormones and the result can be a sudden massive appearance of frogs. Frogs overrun the land in their millions, invading the houses of the Egyptians. They even reach Pharaoh's palace. But Pharaoh refuses to let the Israelites go. The broad plains of Kantir hide thousands of years of history. The great city of P. Ramses. The historical setting for the biblical city of Ramses. Ramses II, the greatest pharaoh of them all. No other ruler of Egypt won such prestige. Was he also the inspiration for the nameless pharaoh of the Bible? We know he made P. Ramses his capital and the symbol of his power. In a plan of the ancient metropolis, the impressive scale of his city is clear to see. The center of Ramses is an island, surrounded by the branches of the Pelusian arm of the Nile. In the west of the city, there's a sprawling villa district, separated from the Pelusian arm of the Nile by this dark line, an embankment along the river. You can see it's a villa district because the streets are arranged in a rectangular grid containing plots of land with individual houses, with a floor area of up to several thousand square meters. In the east of our city plan is the workers' district. You can see here that the workers and artisans lived in small houses with very few rooms, just a few square meters. Ramses II turned Egypt into a building site creating temples and giant statues on a scale never seen before. Monuments forever associated with his name. He needed a cheap and plentiful source of labor. Prisoners of war became slaves for the construction of the city. Others came of their own accord. Egypt's wealth attracted immigrants, many of them fleeing poverty in their own homelands. Could these be the people the Bible means when it says, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pitom and Ramses? And yet there are no historical documents that tell of the presence of Israelites in Egypt. All we know for sure about the people who gathered around Moses is that they were nomadic tribes from Palestine. The era of Ramses II was known as the Golden Age in the Chronicles of Egypt. There was no shadow over the period, no biblical disasters to dull its splendor. But within a hundred years of Ramses' death, his once mighty city would be a byword for downfall and decay. P. Ramses is abandoned. What happened? The disappearance of this mighty metropolis has remained a mystery. The Heidelberg Academy of Sciences and Humanities, paleoclimatologists Augusto Mangini and Nicole Vollweiler are researching climate changes thousands of years ago. 
they've discovered remarkable links between climate and the rise and fall of civilizations. Now they're searching for the reason for the mysterious demise of the city of Ramses. This stalagmite is many thousands of years old. Its inner life will give Mangini the data he needs to recreate the historical climatic curve. 9,000, 7,000, Stalagmites show that our ancestors were confronted with climate change again and again. In fact, they can provide a very precise record of variations in temperature and of wet and dry periods in the ancient past. Stalagmite caves are created when rainwater trickles through from the surface above. Descending through layers of earth and stone, it picks up calcium carbonate that solidifies on the floor of the cave as limestone. Countless evaporated water drops thus build up these columns of stone. Every climatic wet and dry period can be traced in the growth history of the stalagmites. Their age can be calculated through the composition of their isotopes. First, the samples are soaked in acid to separate them into their constituent parts. As they grow, the limestone of the stalagmites absorbs traces of radioactive elements. The concentration of these elements provides the data to calculate their age. They use a mass spectrometer to measure the isotopes and date the stalagmites precisely. It takes two long weeks to find out whether these stalagmites can throw light on the fate of P. Ramses. Finally, the scientists turn all this data into a climatic curve. Mangini and Folweiler correlate the climatic curve to the eras of the Egyptian dynasties. They're sure that each rise and fall of a culture has its counterpart in climatic peaks and troughs. The period of Ramses' reign is highlighted in color. After the peak of a warm, wet climate, there's a climate collapse. Pharaoh Ramses II reigned in a very favorable climatic period. There was plenty of rain and his country flourished. However, this wet period only lasted a few decades. After Ramses' reign, the climate curve goes sharply downwards. There's a dry period which would certainly have had serious consequences. Did climate change bring about the sudden collapse of P. Ramses? For some reason, the inhabitants of the city had to leave. Archaeologists found the first possible clues to the reason, 30 kilometers away from Ramses city, at a much older excavation, that of the city of Tanis. For a long time, we thought Tarnis was P. Ramses, because a huge amount of the most wonderful architectural objects were found there. Granite obelisks and quartz statues, all sorts of other things, all bearing the name of Ramses II. They all told the same story of the growing power and splendor of the city, a story we know both from the hymns and from other Egyptian accounts. Throughout the ruins of Tarnis, they found the royal cartouche of Ramses II, the unmistakable symbol of the great pharaoh. 
but the pedestal and the feet of all the statues were missing. Only one explanation was possible. All these statues had been transferred to Tarnis. So this couldn't be the original site of Ramses' city. But why had they all been moved? In the Bible story, the disasters in the land of the Nile get worse. To force the Pharaoh to yield and free the people of Israel from their bondage, the god Yahweh punished the Egyptians with the third and fourth plagues. Swarms of mosquitoes and flies invaded the land. All the dust, the Bible says, turned into insects. Perhaps Ramses' city was devastated by a series of real plagues that found their way as a folk memory into the story in the book of Exodus. When archaeologists realized Tarnis couldn't be the city of Ramses, they began to look elsewhere. They only knew Ramses had built his capital on the eastern Pelusian arm of the Nile. Here we are at the northern edge of P. Ramses. These are the last traces of the Pelusian arm of the Nile. You have to imagine that this was the main highway for commerce in those days, about 200 meters wide. Now it's a pretty narrow but deep ditch. It's still used for drainage today. Over the millennia, the River Nile has continuously altered its route. Sand from desert storms and mud from the annual flooding filled up one course and another opened. In order to identify the location of P. Ramses, first you had to find the ancient eastern arm of the Nile. For years, Manfred Bietak reconstructed all the old courses of the Nile. He discovered what the delta had looked like in the age of the pharaohs by comparing archaeological maps with the contour lines on a topographical map that revealed abrupt changes in the landscape. You can actually follow the protrusions of the land from one contour line to the next. And from our reconstruction of the Nile's eastern delta, it's very clear where the eastern arm of the Nile lay. And so the focus on where P. Ramses could have been was narrowed down to one place. And that was Kantia. And in the excavations at Kantia, they found conclusive proof. Thousands of shards of pottery from the time of Ramses but no pottery from later periods. The only possible conclusion was that the inhabitants abandoned their city 3,000 years ago and turned their back on an entire region. There would have to be a very good reason to give up a city with a fantastic strategic position like this. The most likely explanation is that the Pelusian arm of the Nile silted up downstream from Piramsis. And so Piramsis had to be abandoned. The climate had changed. A long period of drought and high winds ravaged the landscape of the Nile. We still don't know what causes such natural climate changes and the often dramatic consequences that follow. The climate graph of the ancient world reveals sudden changes over the millennia. For paleoclimatologists, they explain radical changes 
in those early societies. No culture willingly gives up its homeland, along with its splendid cities, unless there's a pretty dramatic reason. If we look at the results of our research into the settlement behavior of our ancestors, it quickly becomes clear that climate has always played an extremely important role, and that long periods of drought have been a reason to move away. P. Ramses turned into a ghost town. Slowly, the Nile, the lifeblood of the city, turned into lakes of still water and silted up. Were algae blooms, fish deaths and insect swarms the result? Is this the source of the plague stories of the Bible? When a river stops flowing, there are biological consequences. Runoff water overloads it with nutrients. The result is algae growth and oxygen depletion. Hydrologists in Berlin are mimicking this scenario by growing algae in experimental tanks. They pour nitrate and phosphate nutrients into water containing burgundy blood algae. In nature, the water would turn red in two to three weeks, indicating a massive presence of toxic organisms. The laboratory test shows why burgundy blood algae can destroy a natural water habitat. The measurements show oxygen levels in the water dropping further and further as the algae concentration increases. These are the biological consequences when flowing water turns into still water. The waters get muddier, the current slows down, and the water temperature rises. The increase in nutrients that follows can lead to the spread of blue algae. And these blue algae can be very toxic. They can unleash a biological chain reaction of the kind described in the first plagues. The river turned red, fish died, frogs left the water and then perished. Now the insects could multiply unhindered. In a self-regulating ecology, insect numbers on the river are kept in check by the frogs and fish. But without this natural regulator, the numbers of insects reproduce explosively. You can imagine a chain reaction like this. A massive increase in the number of frogs would be followed by massive frog deaths, so they would no longer be there to eat the insects. Without fish and frogs, the insects would multiply exponentially. We know insects often carry diseases like malaria, so the next step in the chain reaction is the outbreak of epidemics, causing the human population to fall ill. The authors of the Bible let plague after plague rain down as acts of God. Were these the folk memories of peoples who had experienced similar natural disasters? After the insect plagues, diseases spread among the Egyptians. The flies and mosquitoes departed, but still Pharaoh would not let the Israelites go. And then Yahweh announced the next plagues to Moses. In the trial of strength with Egypt's godlike ruler, plagues five and six would now strike man and beast without mercy. It happens early in the morning. As the sun rises, God sends a pox upon the Egyptians' livestock. And soon after, as the next sign from God, smallpox breaks out among the people.
what the first six plagues of the Bible describe could indeed have taken place at the location of ancient P. Ramses. As the waters sank in the Pelusian arm of the Nile, before they disappeared completely and it silted up, the still waters led to a plague of mosquitoes. Malaria broke out, other plagues and diseases appeared. They affected the population so badly that without a proper supply of fresh water, life in this area, astonishing as it may seem, became impossible. And so the people here had to migrate to healthier regions. This gradual process of decay must have deeply affected life in the dying city. We have a copy of an ancient document from this time that shows astonishing parallels to the Bible story of the plagues. The Ipuver Papyrus. The Rijksmuseum van Udheden in Leiden holds this mysterious Egyptian document. The Warnings of Ipuver. This puzzling text, four meters long, was written hundreds of years before the Old Testament was compiled. In the Ipuver papyrus, the author just imagines the total chaos of a society where people rebelled against their former masters. So servants had the riches and those who were rich lost everything. There was uh, a famine, people were hungry, the Nile didn't inundate properly, the gods were angry with the Egyptians. And he contrasts that with the happy life that Egypt could lead under its king when it sticks to the traditions of the ancestors. That's what he wants to say. Ipuver. We assume this is the name of the wise man who wrote this text. In a poetic style, he describes disasters on a colossal scale. Water turns to blood, society falls into chaos, nature turns against mankind. Hail and darkness fall on the country, animals and humans die. The biblical plagues will later tell almost exactly the same story. The biblical text was not written down as something independent of everything that happened elsewhere in the Near East. It is part of a literary tradition. Part of that tradition is already a thousand years or more old. So it's not surprising that we find elements like descriptions of natural disasters that, that sound familiar. When you know that the text of Ipu where you find something similar in the Bible. We don't know exactly when the text was written. The original has never been found. The copy that we have here in Leiden is the only copy that has, exists. And it is a copy made by an Egyptian around the period of the famous pharaoh Ramses II. Why should a copy of a disaster poem be commissioned at the time of the decline of P. Ramses? More than a coincidence? In P. Ramses, the silting up of the river seals the people's fate. Ramses' capital is condemned to destruction. Citizens carry away whole buildings, break off the statues from their pediments. They move everything to Tarnis, hoping for a new beginning. The monuments of Tarnis are testaments to human willpower, but also to the overwhelming power of nature. P. 
P. Ramses was reclaimed by nature. In Kantir, in a cornfield, the find of an unspectacular stone pedestal closes the circle of history. In a huge effort, almost the whole city of P. Ramses was dismantled, at least the parts made out of stone, and was taken to other locations to build new homes and palaces. The demolition and reconstruction can be seen very clearly via the great statues of Ramses II. Here are the feet in Kantir. Is this the place the Bible was referring to? Is this the city of Moses, the hero of the struggle against the Pharaoh? The city of the plagues and God-sent miracles. In the story of Moses and the plagues, the Pharaoh has no name. He simply represents the tyrannical power oppressing the people of Israel. By the time the biblical texts are written, Pharaoh Ramses II is a figure of legend. For the Egyptians, and at the time the Bible was written, Ramses was the personification of a pharaoh. He was virtually synonymous with the title pharaoh. You didn't even have to say his name. And from the name this city was given, the Old Testament simply calls it Ramses, it was clear that they saw this pharaoh as the pharaoh. Via the name Ramses, they wanted to evoke the great power of Egypt. He is the symbol of Egypt as superpower. Pharaoh Ramses II did not live to see the downfall of his capital. He died of old age at 85. In 1881, his mummy was discovered in an anonymous tomb. When his remains were transported to Cairo, thousands of people lined the shores of the Nile. No one remembered the disasters of ancient times, only the splendor of a golden era. It all began with a red river. Fish die. Frogs invade the land. Swarms of mosquitoes and other insects follow. Diseases attack man and beast, and thus we have the first six plagues of the Old Testament. The silting up of the river is the end for the city of P. Ramses, Environmental disasters, such as those described in the first plagues, would be an entirely realistic scenario. After the sixth plague, God said to Moses, Say unto Pharaoh, Let my people go, or I will send all my plagues upon thine heart, upon thy servants, and upon thy people. Pharaoh would not let his heart be softened by the threat. The plagues continued, and the magnitude of the disasters increased. 